Hi, everybody. Greensmith here once again, talking about resources related to Henry David Thoreau and the conquered crowd of transcendentalists. Hello again. And in this, our 18th episode of the Studying Thoreau video series, I'm going to be talking about relevant periodicals that have been published by special organizations and scholars during the last century. Periodicals, magazines, serials with a capital S, which we would also call journals. But you know what? Today, I'm not going to use that uh, term because I don't want us to get confused with Henry David Thoreau's actual journals, which are important enough on their own. Right? Right. My name's Kareen Smith. I was a librarian for a long time. I have written a couple of books about Henry David Thoreau. And I currently serve as the supervisor of the Thoreau Society shop at Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. This is my own series of shows, though, where I offer my interpretations of the history and the relevance and the usefulness of these materials that I show you. However, today I am going to be talking a lot about the Thoreau Society. And anytime I record these videos, I put up a bibliography on my website, travelswiththoreau.com, so that whatever items I mention, uh, books they've been in the past, uh, I give you links where you can get them. Uh, if they're new books, then you can get them new. If they're out of print, I give them, uh, I give you links to used book dealers where you can find them most of the time. However, the six periodicals that I'm gonna talk about today are different. And so my advice is going to be different. Uh, you may not find individual copies of these periodicals out there in the greater world for sale. Uh, you may find them in academic libraries near you. And the way to do that, the way to find them is to use WorldCat, www.worldcat.org. I will put these links in the summary below also. Uh, WorldCat, uh, you put in your search term, the title, and you put in your zip code, and it tells you what academic libraries near you have it. It's, it's wonderful. Okay. Uh, another resource we're going to talk about today is JSTOR, J S T O R, all capital letters. I uh, will talk about that in a little bit. I can also tell you that all of the periodicals I'm going to talk about today are available for you to see and to use at the Thoreau Institute at Walden Woods, which you can find information about at walden.org slash what hyphen we hyphen do slash library, or go to the banner and click on what we do and go to the library that way. The Thoreau Institute is the specialty archive that is part of the Walden Woods project in Lincoln, Massachusetts, just up the hill behind Walden Pond State Reservation, at the end of Baker Farm Road. The Institute houses the most comprehensive body of Thoreau related material available all in one place. It houses the collections of the Thoreau Society and the Emerson Society, along with thousands of other items, along with all, almost all of the books I'm pretty sure that I have told you about in the past. Um, you do have to make an appointment with the curator to uh, get up there and use the material. Again, you'll find all that information here, walden.org, and then, you, and then you can find that. And I have to thank uh, curator Jeff Kramer for uh, making copies of title pages for me of resources that I don't personally own. So thank you again, Jeff. So if it can be kind of tricky to find these resources today, then why am I even telling you about them? Good question. Thanks for asking. Well, because as you do your own work with Henry, uh, whether it's about his life or his writings or however you want to do it, you may come upon references to some of the articles in these magazines. And I think it would be helpful for you to know where they came from, uh, see what they look like, um, where you can find out where you can get the original articles if you want to. Um, and I think all of that is worthy information so that you can get a better feel for the origins and the coverage offered by these periodicals. Now, you know, in his lifetime, Henry himself published just two books, A Week on the Concord and Mary Mac Rivers and Walden or Life in the Woods. But he also submitted poems and essays to a variety of periodicals of the day. Of course, there was the dial, 
the Transcendental Magazine that came out in the 1840s. Some of his poems and essays appeared in there. Then, of course, Resistance to Civil Government appeared in that one issue magazine called Aesthetic Papers uh, before someone went and changed the name to Civil Disobedience. Another story that I've explained before. And Henry also submitted a number of essays to periodicals like the Atlantic Monthly. Um, isn't it ironic then, when you think about it, that people continue to write periodical articles about him? <laughs> and sometimes they're even in the Atlantic. <laughs> but I digress. And I'm not going to talk about that wider range of media today. I'm going to look at six subject focused magazines, and we're going to approach them generally in chronological order. One more note. As I put this material together, I realized something quite important about these endeavors. They were all initiated by people who were, or who still are, very passionate about their understandings about Henry David Thoreau, about his life, his writings, and his lingering legacy. And these very dedicated people all wanted to share that passion with other people and to ignite it in other people. And so you're going to be hearing some key names in these stories today. I hope you recognize some of them at least by now, because they are among the most important Thoreauvians in our history, quite frankly. Each one of these individuals deserves a lengthier biography than I can give them here today. And we owe a lot to them. Someday we should talk more about them. But for now, on to the periodicals. Number one. First, we have from the Thoreau Society, the Thoreau Society Bulletin. A little mangled here because I've been, <laughs> I've been, been shushling my papers, as we say in Pennsylvania Dutch. <laughs> anyway, the Thoreau Society Bulletin um, was the Thoreau Society was founded in 1941 and immediately the bulletin started. Uh, among the founders of this group was Walter Harding, who would go on to gain the reputation as the foremost Thoreau scholar of the 20th century. And Walter began typing a newsletter just about as soon after a group of about 100 people met in Concord on July 12th, 1941 to celebrate Henry's birthday and they formed the Thoreau Society. And so he became the secretary and the editor of the newsletter. And he served as the editor for 50 years, 50 years, 1941 to 1991. So he started out and he hand typed it at the beginning, he started out with just a single sheet, double-sided. And then over the years, it has grown, it has changed, the masthead has changed, the banner has changed a little bit. Um, always full of articles, um, some society news. Here's an article about the history of the Carn at Walden Pond. Uh, and so uh, also um, key in here, there are book reviews and there are, um, there's an ongoing Thoreau bibliography that started right from the very beginning that Walter started and it's still going strong. So as I record this video, uh, we are up to number 316. Uh, each each uh, quarterly newsletter, it's quarterly. Each newsletter has just a single issue number, no volume, just a single issue number. And so we're up to number 316 as I record this, okay? So like I said, or original articles, here's, here's one on places that Thoreau knew around Concord, uh, and if you join the Thoreau Society, you get these newsletters quarterly. Okay. Now, where can you get them? Thoreau Institute, academic libraries. The shop at Walden Pond and the Thoreau Society does have a few of the most recent issues. And the way to find those is to go to shop at waldenpond.org. Okay. So the most recent issues. Uh, we're going to have available individually for sale. Otherwise, you're probably not going to find individual copies out there unless you go to an estate sale where somebody was a member and they have a whole pile of them. Uh, but you can usually find something special out there, and it is a bound volume of the first 100 
the Rose Society Bulletins, which was released in 1968. How cool is this? The issues covered are from 1941 to 1967. So boom, <laughs> you've got the first 100 issues all in one place. And you can usually find these volumes at used book dealers or on eBay. And all kinds of things, you see all kinds of things. There's a letter from Henry in his own handwriting. Uh, back in the day, Walter Harding put a lot of uh, cartoons in, in there whenever he could. He reprinted cartoons. Here's one with dark humor. Uh, guy holding a smoking gun, dead body on the floor and the policeman and the guy in his defense says, he called Thoreau a tramp. <laughs> dark humor, dark humor. All kinds of cool things. There's the Thoreau family pencil sign that was on the boxes. All kinds of cool things. So actually, this is kind of a, a neat retrospective anyway. And like I said, you can often find this bound volume from used book dealers, okay? So this is, this is kind of cool. What you may also find out there, if you look in the greater world or wherever you search for Thoreau Society Bulletin, you may also find something called a bibliography of the Thoreau Society Bulletin bibliography, 1941 to 1969, which Walter Harding brought out in 1971. This is the title page. I don't have the book. Thank you, Jeff. What he did was take all the bibliographies out of those you know, out of those issues, combine them into a book, okay? You would probably want this one only if you really want to go down a rabbit hole of finding early or mid-century references to Thoreau. Uh, but I can tell you that as I record this video, two copies of that book are on eBay for five bucks each. So if you, if, if that's what you want, um, you want to get started on, on, looking up every single reference to throw. There you go. There's a way to start. However, also, all of the text of the Thoreau Society Bulletin can be found on the academic database called JSTOR, jstor.org. JSTOR used to be available only to people who were affiliated with colleges and universities or who were patrons of really large library systems that had individual uh, institutional subscriptions to it. Uh, it's a database, but you can register with JSTOR as an independent scholar for free. And it used to be that when you did that, you were entitled to look at six articles per month for free. However, as I record this video during the virus crisis, JSTOR has expanded that offer to 100 articles a month for free. I don't know how long that offer is gonna last, uh, but I will give you the exact link down in the summary below of how to register as a, an independent user on JSTOR. Okay, um, so all of the text of the Thoreau Society bulletins uh, you know, even including those first 100, including all of those bibliographies, they're all on JSTOR, okay? So that was the Thoreau Society Bulletin. All right, let's move on sort of to number two with sort of an introduction. First, we're going to move on to the Concord Saunterer. Have you heard of the Concord Saunterer? Maybe you have. Concord Saunterer, first of all, a book with this title, came out in 1940, published by Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont. And the full title is The Concord Saunterer, including a discussion of the, of the nature mysticism of Thoreau by Reginald Lansing Cook, original letters by Thoreau, and a checklist of Thoreau items in the Abernethy Library of Middlebury College, compiled by Viola C. White. So, this little book is uh, an essay about Thoreau's nature mysticism. And then afterwards, um, articles, well, I don't, lists of items that are in the collections, the Thoreau collections at Middlebury College. This is a standalone book, has really nice, colorful maps of Concord on the fly leaves, same one in front and back. It's a standalone book. Uh, it might be of interest to some of you out there, uh, but it has nothing to do 
with the periodical called the Concord Saunterer, okay? This came out in 1940, right? You can find this on used book dealer sites and in used bookstores almost all the time, but that's not the periodical, okay? Let's go on to the periodical called the Concord Saunterer. It's a periodical that was begun by one group and that group eventually merged with another group and that's how we get it today, okay? You'll understand this in a minute. So as I said, that the Rose Society organized in 1941 and its members came from all over, not just from Concord, not just from New England. And basically its office was wherever Walter Harding happened to be, okay? And in his academic career, eventually that landed him in SUNY Geneseo in Western New York State. So for its first 50 years, the Thoreau Society did not have a physical presence in Concord, except for the one weekend in July every year when they got together and still get together in Concord uh, for the annual meeting. Now, in 1966, a group of Concordians got together and they decided that there should be a center for Henry in his hometown, shouldn't there? And they decided they were gonna make one and they called their group, the Thoreau Foundation. And they operated from a house on Belknap Street, not far from the train station. And they called that house, the Thoreau Lyceum. This property was right next to one that the Thoreau family used to own and used to live on, except that their house burned down in the 1930s. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Texas house, in the family history of the Thoreaus. Well, Belknap Street was in the part of Concord that was then in Henry's day called Texas. And so the Texas house was right next to this house that they operated the Lyceum at. That's as close as they could get. They were right next to that property, okay? That was the property that, uh, and the house that the Thoreaus lived in when Henry was at Walden Pond. And then in 1850, they moved to the Yellow House on Main Street, and that's where Henry lived for his last 12 years. Okay, so again, the Lyceum was right next to where the Texas house used to be. Still pretty cool. That's as close as they could get. One of the first people associated with the Lyceum was Mary Sherwood. Um, and after she left for most of its existence, it was managed by Anne Root McGrath. And for years, the Lyceum drew visiting Thoreauvians to it. I didn't get a chance to see it myself, but I've heard lots of great stories about it. Um, they held talks, they held programs, they had a small library and museum, they sold books and memorabilia, and they produced a periodical called The Concord Saunterer. It became a quarterly publication. At first, its editor was Ann McGrath, but eventually the editor became Tom Blanding. And it also contained articles of original research and random illustrations and announcements about new tidbits of discoveries. There's Henry's Rouse portrait um, and uh, things that related to, to uh, Thoreau or to Walden Pond. And if you were a member of the Thoreau Foreau you got copies of the Thoreau Cor the uh, Concord Saunter. Now, the folks at the Lyceum promoted the Thoreau Society's annual meetings and society members frequented the rooms of the Lyceum. The two groups did have a lot in common. You know, they, 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 they were unique. They had distinct personalities with storied histories. Some of the details about these two groups can be found in Barksdale Maynard's book, Walden Pond, a history. Why? Because both groups were involved with Walden, of course, okay? So in the early 1980s, it was obvious that the two organizations were working towards the same goal, really, which is to promote Thoreau's life, work, and legacy, and passing that passion for Henry on to other people. So after years of meetings, and discussions, the Thoreau Foundation and its Lyceum officially merged with the Thoreau Society 
in 1983. The new group kept the Thoreau Society name and its members started to receive both the bulletins quarterly and the Concord Saunterer. And uh, they, when they produced the Saunterer, they had both names at the bottom of the, of the cover. And the covers always had uh, Sophia's drawing, Sophia Thoreau's drawing of Thoreau's Walden House on it. So the Saunterer started in 1966, several times a year, uh, is, I think it became quarterly, and up through 1991, they had volume numbers and issue numbers. And uh, like I said, the covers were all of Sophia's, Sophia's uh, Walden House drawing. In 1991 and 1992, though, the publication fell by the wayside because uh, devoted Thoreauvians, especially the ones living in Concord, were dealing with a lot of other matters. Uh, see Barksdale's book for more on those developments. If you're interested, you may already know what I'm referring to, uh, but they were busy. 1991, 92 was a very busy time for Thoreauvians in Concord. And so no Concord Saunters. When it came back in 1993, it had a new series title on it. It was deemed a new series. It started over with volume one, number one. <laughs> this is a librarian's nightmare, I gotta tell you, for the fall 1993 issue. It quickly became an annual, an annual with a single volume number for each one okay and each one has lengthy articles uh, mostly scholarly lengthy articles about Thoreau about uh, other other related things here's an article about Ellen Sewell if you know Thoreau you know the story about Ellen Sewell okay um, it kept Sophia's drawing on the cover until 2007 when it was decided that the title needed a little tweaking to get it to relate more to Thoreau. So instead of just the Concord Saunter, starting in 2007, it changed to the Concord Saunter, a journal of Thoreau studies <sighs> with a title change, but kept the, kept the volume and the issues going, <laughs> kept the volume going. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, again, if you're a member of the Thoreau Society and each cover is unique. And so if you're a member of the Thoreau Society, you get four bulletins a year and you get one conquered saunter a year with the lengthier articles in them. Okay. I'm telling you, that's a librarian's nightmare. Name changes, volume changes, ISSN changes. <laughs> Duh. But that's a conquered saunter. Now, where can you find copies of the Concord Saunter? Some of these you can find on eBay. Uh, as I record this, uh, there's, uh, there's at least one or two issues on eBay. Uh, the shop at Walden Pond, again, shop at waldenpond.org has some of the last ones. Uh, and uh, when you're looking for it out there, remember Concord Saunter, uh, remember, remember what you look for. Usually the ones that you find are the ones with Sophia's drawing on the cover. Remember that you may accidentally come up with a 1940 book when you search. This is not what you want, probably. Okay, you want you want the periodicals. Okay, so where can you find issues of it? Uh, the shop has some. Uh, all of the contents are on JSTOR. Again, JSTOR. You can register for free. All right, and um, that's where you can find them. Uh, now, what happened? to the Thoreau Lyceum? Well, uh, for a variety of reasons, the decision was made to sell the building at the end of 1994. It reverted to a private residence. It is still a private residence. It's in a residential neighborhood uh, near the train station. And because people still wanted a place in Concord where Thoreau enthusiasts could stop for information or could talk to somebody knowledgeable or could buy mementos and keepsakes, they negotiated with the state so that the Thoreau Society could operate a shop at Walnut Pond State Reservation. And so a shop 
staffed by the Thoreau Society, has been on the state park property since 1995. And so that's what we have today. Okay, as you can tell, this history is more than just about the actual publications. Okay, <clears throat> it really is. All right, onward, ever onward to number three. I mentioned that Mary Sherwood was with the Thoreau Lyceum and the Thoreau Foundation a little bit at the beginning, briefly at the beginning. She was also a member of the Thoreau Society. When she left Concord and the Lyceum, she moved to Old Town, Maine, where she started an organization called the Thoreau Fellowship. This new group was affiliated with the Department of English at the University of Maine at Orono, and um, the Thoreau Fellowship published a periodical called the Thoreau Journal Quarterly. It came out, started to come out in 1969, and it ran to 1981. It was intended to be, it was intended to be a hybrid publication of professional, semi-professional, and popular items, and of course, uh, about Thoreau's life and works, special focus on his trips and connections to Maine. Uh, many times there were um, tribute poems by people to Thoreau. Uh, so quite a variety of articles in here. There were a, a total between 1969 and 1981, a total of 49 issues. They all have the same cover. Okay, they all, they all look the same. And it, it, they all have the Thoreau journal um, quote, uh, about going around the world by the old Marlboro Road. So that's that's what, what the motif there is. Okay, so there were a total of 49 issues published under the Thoreau Journal Quarterly title. Um, and um, yeah, so 1969 to 1981. And then, sort of segue here, then, in 1981, the responsibility for producing the Thoreau Journal Quarterly moved to the Department of Philosophy at the University of Minnesota, where John Dolan became its editor and the magazine had a name change from Thoreau Journal Quarterly to Thoreau Quarterly, a journal of literary and philosophical studies. It ran from 1982 to 1985 for a total of seven issues. I know these organizations have similar names. The magazines have similar names. What are you gonna do? That's why I'm explaining this. <laughs> I, think you, I think you have a right to know. <laughs> so where can you find these? Fortunately, they're not in JSTOR. I'm sorry, at least not yet, okay? Some academic libraries have them. Actually, a fair number of academic libraries have them. But also, the Thoreau Society and the Shop at Walden Pond have the remainder issues of these. So if you go on shopatwaldenpond.org and you just search for the word quarterly, you'll come up with both. And, and if you're interested, uh, you know, again, if, if you're interested, you can, yeah, <laughs> you, can, you can use them, okay? Ah, all right, so that brings us up to number five. And that one is the Thoreau Research Newsletter. Thank you, Jeff, for the copy. Produced by independent scholar Brad Dean, Bradley P. Dean, in 1990 and 1991. He intended it to be a newsletter circulating among colleagues and not a full-scale scholarly publication. Each issue included notes from some of the subscribers describing research they were doing, uh, for example, um, this one <clears throat> has an article by Ed Schofield about the Thoreaus in the 1855 census. Uh, Ed used to like to go through um, primary sources and find the Thoreaus, so he did census work about them, and he was sharing his information there. So Brad's Thoreau Research Newsletter came out 1990-1991, uh, sent to associates uh, mostly. Uh, but then in, and, and it was it lasted for two years, so it had a total of eight issues. 
And then in 1991, when Walter Harding uh, retired from doing the Thoreau Society bulletins, Brad became the editor of the bulletin. So he stopped producing his own Thoreau news research newsletter. Where can you find these? Probably just at the Thoreau Institute. I know they have them. Uh, you might find them in estate sales for scholars who subscribe to it, um, but, but that's probably, but you might wanna know at least that it exists. And actually, Brad wasn't the only person to run his own Thoreau related newsletter without a larger group uh, behind him back in the 1930s before the Thoreau Society was even founded, one of its founders and its first president it would become, Raymond Adams, produced his own Thoreau newsletters from 1936 to, 1990, to 1936 to 1944, um, sent out about a dozen and a half to interested friends and colleagues, and it's kind of got the momentum going to create the Thoreau Society. His efforts certainly led to the creation of that organization and copies of his newsletters are at the Thoreau Institute at Walden Woods. And really, when you think of the times, it all makes sense, doesn't it? A lot of us remember the days before the internet, before email, before social media made such connections like this one easier. Fans started newsletters, that's what they did. And sometimes somebody close to a celebrity issued a newsletter. Last year, when I was going through some of my boxes at home, I found a stack of old Carpenter's newsletters. That's Karen and Richard, by the way, that's not wood and nails, the Carpenter's. And I decided that I didn't need them anymore. So I sold them to a grateful fan on eBay. Um, I still have a stack of John Denver newsletters from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. They're not going anywhere. Um, but I digress again. Newsletters and printed publications. This is how we got the word out there. This is how we got other people interested. This is how we found and connected with our tribes. Right? Right. The last series that I want to talk about today is uh, kind of different, uh, and I only have the title page for it. Studies in the American Renaissance. These are book length. They look like reference books. They're about an inch thick. Each one's about maybe 400 pages full of articles. It's a whole series. We were printed uh, from annually from 1977 to 1996, so for 20 years, and the editor is Joel Meyerson, okay? Studies in the American Renaissance. Now, this goes beyond Thoreau, all right? Uh, Emerson, anybody around that time, Dickinson, Higginson, anybody you can think of in the 18, in the middle of the 1800s, right? Okay, uh, again, edited by Joel Meyerson at the University of South Carolina, another key researcher and uh, former president of the Thoreau Society, actually. So you may, again, come upon references to articles in studies in the American Renaissance. Um, they're big fat books. Uh, academic libraries may have them on the reference shelves. Sometimes that's where they are. However, all of the texts of these are in JSTOR. So you would have access to them. And again, academic libraries and the Thoreau Institute near you. Now, you know, if you piled up, if you piled up all of these publications uh, and built a tower out of them, <laughs> and that's not even thinking about those 20 bound volumes of the studies in the American Renaissance, okay? If you, if you just took all the rest, the bulletins, the saunters, the journal quarterlies and the quarterlies, and you stacked them all up, you would create a tower that is more than six feet tall. Is, is, is that amazing? Can you imagine all of these stories and curiosities and questions and answers that reveal new facts or new perspectives and all the research that individuals are doing about Henry David Thoreau and they wanna share it with others or they wanna share poetry or they wanna share inspirations or tell you where to get books. Oh, wow, wow, really just a lot of information. Um, author Eric Weiner last year 
said that when he started following in Thoreau's footsteps, he found people that knew a lot about Thoreau and they were not affiliated with any one institution. They were independent scholars and enthusiasts and he described them as feral and self-taught. Well, yeah. <laughs> And these, these, these are the issues that come out of that kind of thing. <laughs> these are the products of some of the work of these people who are feral and self-taught and their shared research and new findings encourage new research and new findings. And then you, you eventually come up with a tower of them that's more than six feet tall. <laughs> really, <laughs> it's amazing. Now, are you going to be interested in every single article of every single one of these? No. <laughs> are you going to agree with everybody that writes in these? No. And you know what? I hope you don't, because that's what makes the field ever more interesting. And if you don't agree with these people and you have stuff to prove it, write your own, right? Write your own article. Add to the genre. Add to our shared knowledge. Add to the hive the high view, something like that. Um, but still, if you're a casual reader of these issues, you will learn some interesting tidbits and facts that you didn't know before. And if you are doing specific research about some specific aspect of Thoreau's life or writings, you may find out that somebody did something maybe long ago and wrote something that could help you. For example, when I was tracing Thoreau's 1861 trip to Minnesota and I uh, was looking at past research, I found out that Mary Sherwood went out to Minnesota and she wrote two articles that appeared in two different issues of her publication about following where Henry David Thoreau and Horace Mann Jr. went, different places that they went in Minnesota. So that helped, that helped. Um, I also found in the Thoreau Quarterly, since this was produced in Minnesota, uh, one of the issues, courtesy of Dale Shui, uh, thanks Dale, uh, reproduced the letter, the thank you letter that Henry wrote to uh, Dr. Charles Anderson, who had squired Henry and Horace around the Twin Cities area. This is cool stuff. This is cool stuff. And it, it, it's out there. It's out there. Okay, and uh, most of it is, uh, like I said, most of it's indexed in, in JSTOR, but you can find it, in, you know, and throw Institute, eh, all these places, yes. Okay, so both of those pieces were uh, helpful to me in my own search. And you know what? <clears throat> those of us who are out here and who are feral and self-taught, guilty, those of us who are out here and are feral and are self-taught, are here in our little homes and are in our little workspaces. <clears throat> and we're reading and researching and writing on our own, looking at Thoreau. And we're coming up with our own perspectives about something related to him. And we're in our own little functional silos, as we say now. And it's only when we get one of these magazines or when we come together at the annual gathering or come together at other conferences with other like-minded people, um, or we come to Concord or we come to the pond that we realize, hey, you know what? We're not the only ones out here doing this stuff. <laughs> We're not the only ones out here reading and writing and wondering about Thoreau. Other people are out there in their own homes and their own workspaces, their own functional silos, and they're dealing with other parts of him. And then they're sharing their findings with us. It's, it's very confirming. <laughs> it's very confirming for those of us who are feral and self-taught that we're not alone. There's other people doing it. And there have been other people doing this for decades, guys, decades. Also, the two remaining print periodicals from the Thoreau Society that are still going, the Thoreau Society Bulletin and the Concord Saunterer are always on the lookout for submissions, guys. So if you are in the mood to share and to write, uh, please create something and share it with the rest of us. Add to the tower, all right? Add to the six foot tower, why not? Not everything is known about Henry, believe it or not. 
<laughs> new things come up all the time. And this is how you find out about it, you know? Uh, so if you, if you do get the urge to um, write up something, you do want to submit to the bulletin or the saunter, go to um, the rowsociety.org. The rowsociety.org. Uh, look about us or under publications. And uh, you'll find out how to submit if you're not a member. And you can submit without being a member if you don't want to be. And that, my friends, is our exhaustive review <laughs> of specialized periodicals that have dealt with and are still dealing with Henry David Thoreau, his life, his work, everything, all due to some very dedicated and passionate people. Thank you all for bringing us this treasure. And thank you guys again for joining me on this episode of Studying Thoreau. Feel free to leave a comment below, especially if I missed something. <laughs> I have a feeling I probably did. You can subscribe to this channel with the red box. You can ring the bell up on top to receive notifications of new postings. I still have more videos planned in this series, so stay tuned. Not sure what the next one will be or when it will arrive, but uh, you'll be the first to know. Till then, thanks again. I'm Corrine Smith. Happy reading. <laughs>